Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're located. My name is Sarit Katan Gribitz. I'm an associate professor of Judaism in the theology department at Fordham and the acting director of the Center for Jewish Studies this year. I want to welcome you all virtually to our community, whether you're a regular at our events or this is your first time, and to thank you for joining us to hear a talk today by Golan Moskowitz about his newly published and fascinating book, Wild Visionary, Maurice Sendak in Queer Jewish Context with a response by Naomi Seidman. After I introduce today's speakers, or before I introduce today's speakers, I want to invite you to all of our upcoming spring semester events. You can find the information and the registration links on our blog and through our newsletter. And in a moment, I'll place the relevant links into the chat so that you have easy access to them. Our next event will take place next week on Wednesday, February 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we will be hosting Ephraim Shoham Steiner from Ben-Gurion University in Israel, who will be speaking about his new book, Jews and Crime in Medieval Europe, in conversation with two of my Fordham colleagues, Nicholas Paul and Magda Tedder. Maurice Sendak was a big part of my childhood. My mother read Where the Wild Things Are, of course, um, but I also grew up with In the Night Kitchen, Outside Over There, The Nutshell Library Books, and Higgledy Piggledy Pop, and um, the beautiful evocative illustrations of Little Bear. But more recently, I read these books to my own children, um, not least because my son is named after the eponymous hero of the wild things. And I remember fondly the Jewish Museum's exhibit about Sendak's art some years ago. Somehow, these books are still resonant and moving so many years later. These are only some of the reasons why I am especially excited that Golan Moskowitz has recently published a book on Maurice Sendak in queer Jewish context and that he will share some of his findings with us today. Golan is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and Catherine and Henry Geisman Faculty Fellow at Tulane University where he teaches courses on Jewish gender and sexuality, Holocaust studies and Jewish comics and graphic novels. In addition to his book, he is the author of several publications on intergenerational memory and post-Holocaust family narratives. Golan's work has been supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, and the Tauber Institute for the Study of European Jury. Golan received his doctorate from Brandeis University, and he was the Ray D. Wolf Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Toronto before joining the faculty at Tulane. I'm really honored that Golan will be joined today by Naomi Seidman, who is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto and a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow. Her publications include Faithful Renderings, Jewish Christian Difference and the Politics, sorry, Jewish Christian Difference and the Politics of Difference, um, The Marriage Plot or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, and Sarah Schneier, Schneer and the Basiakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, which won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies. And she's presently working on a study of Freud in Hebrew and Yiddish literature. Golan will speak for 35 minutes or so, after which Naomi will offer her reflections and questions. Once Golan and Naomi are finished with their formal remarks, I will have a chance to jump in and ask them some of the questions that you have. During and after the talk, please submit your questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't manage if we don't manage to ask and answer all of the submitted questions, we'll be sure to share them with Golan after the talk. For those who wish to purchase Golan's book, in a moment I'll place a coupon code for a discount in the chat as well. Golan and Naomi, thank you for being here today um, and sharing your work with us. And um, I will now pass it over to you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Dr. Gribitz. Um, I should say very generous. I'm uh, assistant, not associate professor, but uh, really appreciate the, the kind words and the excitement about this project. 
And uh, I'm so honored that Naomi Seidman is here with us uh, to be in conversation after I give my remarks. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Tedder for the invitation to speak and everyone on Zoom who's tuning in today uh, or tonight, wherever you are. I really appreciate it. When Maurice Sendak passed away in 2012, he did so as a cultural legend. The approximately 90 book titles that he left behind offered us such unforgettable young icons as Little Bear, whose unabashed animality belies his Victorian cross-hatched appearance, Rosie, who commands attention through her theatrical improvisations from her stoop side in Brooklyn, and most famously, Max, whose bedroom tantrum transports him into the wilderness of wild things and their timeless rumpus. The New York Times described Sendak as one of the most powerful people in the US due to his ability to give shape to the fantasies of millions of children. Indeed, Sendak's books had sold 30 million copies in the US alone during his lifetime. And as of January 2020, Where the Wild Things Are was the fourth most circulated book in the entire history of the New York Public Library. Driving Sendak's success, as he understood it, was his ability to recall, to humanize, and to formally exalt the emotional qualities of childhood, including its unpleasant, awkward, and painful aspects. He, he pierced through rose-colored adult cliches of childhood, simplicity, and innocence. But I asked what allowed him this effective access? And what specific kind of early childhood did his work recall? Sendak's own lower middle class Brooklyn childhood spanned the Depression and World War II in a family of Yiddish speaking immigrants. It was also a queer child, childhood. The term queer is of course an umbrella term for non-normative iterations of gender and sexuality, but may also refer more generally to the socially atypical, to the category defiant, or to the problematizing including ethnic or emotional otherness or perceived strangeness, especially in monocultural contexts. Thus, I argue, as others have begun to do so, that Sendak is queer for having been gay in the mid 20th century, also for having been a sensitive man who exceeded normative American masculinity, for having been part of an immigrant family marked by World War II traumas, and for having been a relentlessly subversive and contrary personality. The present talk will analyze examples of the dynamic relationship between Sendak's picture book creations and his queer Jewish subjectivity in order to introduce some of the central concerns of my new book, Wild Visionary Maurice Sendak in Queer Jewish Context. It will mostly focus on Sendak's early entry into the picture book form in the 1950s, which I'm hoping will whet your appetite for the rest of the book's contents. And the study itself positions the work of his emerging career against the normalizing project implicit in post-war American children's media, which sought to validate and enforce an abstracted child symbol positioned to rebuild the nation in the image of reductive and ultimately exclusive ideals, what Nicholas Salmond calls the generic child. Sendak's work draws connection between his own estranged feelings and the queer feelings of early childhood itself. It does so in ways that both subverted prevalent ideals of social conformism and helped carve space for unusual and culturally complex subject positions like his own. Before I get into the source analysis, I'd like to offer a few words of context. Though Sendak was already always a queer Jewish, Jewish hero to me, um, if an understated one, from as far back as the days of my own childhood in the late 80s, early 90s, to others, it seemed that his Jewishness and queerness were footnotes or mere adjectives, unworthy of creative amplification or of deeper analysis. There have been some delightful exceptions. Playwright Tony Kushner, for example, a friend of Sendak's, published a beautifully written coffee table sized book about Sendak that begins the work of situating his genius within Sendak's Jewish and queer perspectives. Kushner's study focuses specifically on Sendak's designs for opera and theater between 1980 and 2003. Since then, a small number of children's literature scholars, including Kenneth Kidd, have made brief references to Sendak's queerness in studies focused on other topics. Nick Salvato uh, published an article that does look at queerness specifically within one of Sendak's works, uh, The Production Really Rosy, 
And Leslie Tannenbaum and Hamida Bozmajian have also looked at Jewishness and Holocaust consciousness in individual articles on Really Rosie and Dear Millie, respectively. Beyond the scholarly realm, Ella German, uh, an artist, excited the New Yorker's cover editor with her image of a queer Jewish wild things chuppah ceremony, but the image was ultimately rejected. Of course, no artist's work should be reduced to or defined by the artist's identity alone. Still, given the ways in which critics have sometimes painted Sendak's work as obscure or even as inappropriate for children, I found it crucial to more substantially engage the growing literature on queer Jewish studies and to more intensively consider the impact of Sendak's own Jewishness and queerness on his creative vision. Though it wasn't until 2008, at the ripe age of 80, that Sendak announced to the broader public that he was gay in the New York Times interview, my research would indicate that he harbored queer feelings since childhood and very much was aware of his own sexuality by his teenage years, remaining open about it with his friends and loved ones throughout most of his adulthood. Friends of his have told me Sendak was not closeted, he simply was not it was not desired to, that he would be gay. It was not something that the public wanted to see. Moreover, he repeatedly suggested that his work was essentially autobiographical and that it revealed, it revealed what the public refused to acknowledge about him. And on screen, I offer just uh, two of such instances. The business of being an artist is indulging oneself. My work points in no direction other than to me. And much later, everything I've done is so personal. God of people, could read what I've written about myself. It reveals everything, but they don't. My intention to study Sendak in queer Jewish context gained further fuel from the claims made by children's literature scholars like Philip Nell, who had corresponded directly with Sendak by telephone and declared in a comment on his blog in 2011 that a queer history of children's literature was hidden in plain sight and that it had yet to emerge. Others also soon took note. It seemed we had perhaps finally arrived at an era in which significant portions of the public might acknowledge, and dare I say even celebrate, the stigmatized but powerful contributions of a denigrated queer creativity in the realm of children's literature, and without descending into panic about the sexual implications of children's exposure to queer art. Children's literature scholars have helped pave the way for this moment for decades, working to demonstrate that queerness is more than sex and that childhood is itself already a queer cultural realm out of which we are all socialized into public norms. Very young people tend to be bold questioners, deeply perceptive thinkers and fantastical imaginers because they have to be. The normalization of growing up often comes at the expense of this queer sensitivity, open-mindedness and creativity that artists are known to actively preserve and cultivate through their practice. The prevalence of marginal voices in successful children's literature thereby sheds light, I, arg I argue, on children's own relation to marginality and their hunger for representations that acknowledge their own possibilities as socially uninitiated creatives situated both inside and outside of mainstream life. With these insights in mind, it struck me as strange and dissatisfying that a book length study of Sendak through his own culturally and historically based marginality through queer and Jewish lenses had not yet appeared. So I set out to write one myself. Historiographically speaking, my book responds to calls made by Jewish historians like Ellie Letterhandler and Beth Cohen to study those whose narratives exceed the mainstream tropes of American Jewish history as a story about acculturation through an embrace of public education relocation to the suburbs in the years following World War II, and a seamless integration into middle-class American whiteness. Instead, my study looks beyond these frameworks to focus on a cultural giant anti-assimilationist output as a discreetly gay Jewish son of lower middle-class Polish immigrants who never mastered English and who remained in Brooklyn throughout Sendak's post-war adolescence and early adulthood. Sendak was a serious and privately flamboyant introvert who hated public school and suffered queer shame and social obscurity, entering his 40s before Stonewall, before the advent of gay liberation. He experienced the secondhand effects of the Holocaust on his family before the era of institutionalized Holocaust memory. And his bold depictions of decidedly non-Anglo-Saxon protagonists 
subverted the uncritical subsuming of the cultural category of Jewishness into middle-class American whiteness. My book follows Sendek on his unusual solitary path toward American success and ambivalent belonging, which he painstakingly carved for himself through deeply introspective creativity and with the help of powerful sensitive mentors, including Ruth Krauss, Ursula Nordstrom, and his therapist Bertram Slack, who was also gay and Jewish. When most of us think of Maurice Sendak, what we usually think of, uh, as Dr. Gribitz mentioned, is Where the Wild Things Are, published in 1963, with its vivid dramatization of Max's departure into solitary fantasy, it directly conveys Sendak's own childhood negotiation between private intense feelings and his acculturating Jewish family's aspirations, fears, and values. Like Sendak, Max is a hybrid of an all-American child and a wild thing, a Vildechaya, as Sendak's parents sometimes called him. Sadie and Philip con constantly contrasted the young Sendak's irreverent childhood energies with idealized cousins whom they mourned in the 1940s. And I quote Sendak on screen, if I was staying out late and dinner was on the table and I'd been called three times, my mother's voice would tell me that I'd better go up now. And I'd go up. And she'd say, your cousins, they're in a concentration camp. You have the privilege of being here and you don't come up and eat. They have no food. I was made to feel guilty all the time. It constantly made me feel that I was shamelessly enjoying myself when they were being cooked in an oven. Even more distressing were moments in which Sadie wailed and pulled out her hair or when Philip physically collapsed, including on the morning of Sendak's own bar mitzvah in June, 1941 which took place the same month in which Germany invaded the Soviet Union, where most of the Sendaks remained and perished. Preceding his most celebrated books, Sendak's less studied work in the decade following World War II began to draw from his complex subject position. This early work conveys how Sendak, like Max, internalized a sense of endangerment as he clashed with public American ideals of childhood in those years. Sendak's early books comprise some of the first work in American children's media to connect children with the emotional position of the insider-outsider. At a time when Jewish American advocacy groups sought to promote a vision of Jews as normal, quote unquote, mostly white Americans, whose feelings were no different than those of the proverbial Dick or Jane, Sendak's work grappled with serious emotional predicaments faced by young people. Central to his creative work is the vital need to survive social incoherence in a reality that fluctuates between secure and dangerous. As the artist asserted, children turn to picture books not only for optimism or for delight, but also sometimes for self-preservation in order to confront the incomprehensible in their lives, bullies, school, and the vagaries of the adult world. Thus, even before Wild Things, before the onset of the social liberation movements of the 60s and 70s, Sendak began to address those children not yet enfranchised by the dominant social order by engaging them through the universally effective queer prism of early childhood emotions. As I suggested, Sendak entered children's publishing at a time in which American children's literature portrayed Jews as seamlessly American and bourgeois, at least in mannerism. One example being Sidney Taylor's All of a Kind Family, which follows a well-mannered Jewish family on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The book's universalist tone and wholesome American sensibility led it to become the first Jewish book to be widely read by non-Jewish children. But works like these fail to represent the sort of children in childhood that Sendak recalled from his own experience. Far from a Sidney Taylor sort of youth, he remembered kids getting hit by cars, suffering abuse at the hands of their own parents at times, fearing anti-Semites, and struggling to gain attention and love in a gritty, incomprehensible world mediated by exhausted fathers and anxious mothers. Sendak himself had struggled to actualize as a social being, juggling his family's old world mentalities, wider American social expectations, and his own private queer feelings, like the crush he developed on the male Hebrew school teacher who prepared him for his bar mitzvah. A sickly indoors boy whom others called a sissy, Sendak was a dramatic storyteller with few friends as a young person. He spent most of his time with his siblings indoors. He was, in his own words, a terrified child growing into a withdrawn, stammering boy 
who became an isolated, untrusting young man. Sendak's adolescence was split between competing and contradictory social realities. On the one hand, a traumatized local community mourning its destroyed European shtetls and slaughtered families. And on the other hand, the pull of an optimistic, forward-looking American dream, which idealized childhood innocence and the conventional suburban family and encouraged ignorance about difficult recent pasts. Sendak's private queer feelings threatened his belonging on both sides of this equation and further removed him from the possibility of emotional transparency or social actualization. Accordingly, the artist's books would visually dramatize dualities of inside, outside, darkness, light, fantasy, reality. They asked how emerging individuals survive insufficient emotional guidance, physical and social danger, and forbidden or impossible desires spread, spread across various realms or dimensions. The summer after graduating high school in 1946, 17-year-old Sendak lived for a time in Hell's Kitchen in the heart of an enclave filled with young working class gay youths. During those years, the New York City police and governing authorities continued to harass and persecute gay and queer people and the establishments that served them. A meek new employee at his first full-time job at the warehouse of a Manhattan window display company, Sendak described this period as one of the best times of his life. But when he first entered children's publishing in the early 1950s, following struggles with his mental health that led him to move back in with his parents, he did so because he thought it was a good place to be an artist in hiding. Children's literature, like comic books and other genres that were then considered low art, so to speak, offered a way to hide in plain sight as an artist. It was a place from which to be loud and passionate and emotionally honest, even when the adult public deemed one excessive or deviant. With the help of mentors and years of psychoanalysis, the artist would pave his own way to professional distinction through an unyielding devotion to the emotions of his queer Jewish childhood, which he transformed into universal aesthetic experiences that spoke to children across religious, class, and racial and ethnic divides. In the spring of 1950, Harper editor Ursula Nordstrom first discovered Sendak as a mild-mannered 22-year-old now commuting from Brooklyn to his job as an FAO Schwartz window decorator uptown. A revolution was already brewing in children's publishing and Nordstrom was its leader. Appointed director of Harper and Brothers Children Book Department in 1940, she took the side of unruly children against what she perceived as a desensitized generic adult world designed to reproduce itself. Upon meeting Sendak, Nordstrom had already begun to publish revolutionary picture books by Jewish American author Ruth Krauss. Nordstrom wasted no time in introducing Krauss to Sendak, a potential new illustrator. Krauss soon collaborated with him on several works, also mentoring the young artists. Specifically, she both scandalized and thrilled a reticent Sendak by granting him the permission to express his creativity with less self-consciousness, especially around sexuality and gender. Krauss had studied anthropology under Margaret Mead and had other close gay friends. She spoke bluntly to Sendak about the human body and the naturalness of sexual desire. Sendak later recounted, I was both shocked and so elated that my thoughts were not sick and putrid as I thought that they were as I suspect most young people of that generation thought, because how could you know? No one else talked about it. No one would confirm your fantasies or answer your questions. Krauss's sensibilities shaped Sendak's aesthetic and taste. Against the bourgeois taboos of children's publishing at the time, he absorbed her frank demeanor and aversion to prudishness, freeing himself to access the animal passions of early childhood. His first collaboration with Krauss, A Hole is to Dig, helped him first put into practice some of the queer liberation that he experienced through her mentorship. Krauss corrected drafts of the artwork in which she felt Sendak was still constraining boys and girls to stereotypically gendered behaviors, leading the artist to alter for the final publication the sexes and gender expressions of some of the children in the book. In one image, for example, beside a caption, a mustache is to wear on Halloween, a child is an over, uh, wears an oversized uh, blazer standing beside a child in a skirt. Both wear mustaches and extend limp wrists into the air. 
In another scene, we see a boy wearing an apron tied with a large bow as he washes dishes. Sendak also included a girl valiantly leading a processional march and children of different genders working together to build a wooden structure. He would later brag that some of the children in this book, their gender was not easy to determine. These illustrations broke with middle-class convention in several ways, drawing instead from his sketches of Jewish and Sicilian children of Brooklyn, whom he both saw as freewheeling and world-weary creatures with awkward proportions. Commenting on the drawing, Sendak once said, they're all a kind of caricature of me. They look as if they've been hit on the head and hit so hard they weren't ever going to grow up anymore. Thus, in addition to being sometimes ambiguously gendered, these kids were at least in part ethnic outsiders as well. Sendak drew children not as idealized young citizens, but as queerly rebellious individuals, a revolutionary act in the US of the 1950s. The success of his work, and the whole Hadig did sell over 80,000 copies by its fifth year in publication, demonstrated the demand among post-war children for emotional recognition beyond the social idealism that surrounded childhood in those years. Queer embodiments of gender, sensuality, and ethnicity are not so easily separated from each other in Sendak's work. For Krauss's I'll Be You and You Be Me, for example, he visualized Skippy and Hoppy as two boys drawn in a similar style to those of a Holus to Dig, but these boys swap names and lean their heads against each other. For the line, we'd be like twins, two dark haired girls embrace and gaze into each other's eyes. These visual moments comprise the first depictions of same sex affection in any of Krauss's published work and possibly in American children's books more broadly. Years later in Janice May Udry's Let's Be Enemies, Sendak would even more boldly place two smiling boys together in a narrow bed. Beyond offering a mirror to queer readers afraid of their own social difference at the time, Sendak's early illustrations also work against the queer phobia that continues to shape broader desensitization of boyhood emotional vulnerability and the diminishment of girlhood ambition among all subjects, heterosexual subjects included, as a perceived threat to a patriarchal heteronormative social order. While Sendak's mid-century Harper illustrations lack the explicit references to Jewish religion that we find in say, Taylor's All of a Kind Family, their lovable awkwardness, flamboyance, and wild exp <coughs> excuse me, expressiveness offered a more inclusive ethnic and emotional landscape than did Taylor's, whose acculturated Jewish characters spoke and behaved with the same sanitized propriety as their American Gentile peers. In the few early works about Jewish holidays that Sendak did illustrate for Jewish organizations, the images appear in a manner that contrasted with Taylor's prim stylizations. He rendered Jewish youth as quirky, emotive, and anxiously inward. A first example was Good Shabbos, Everybody by Robert Garvey, published by the United Synagogue Commission on Jewish Education. Following this work, Sendak offered drawings for Little Stories on Big Subjects, published by the Anti-Defamation League. These continue to convey, visually, the queer sensitivities of child outsiders. One story, for example, includes a boy with darker features who is tricked by a group of blonde peers whose staring light-colored eyes warn him of the danger that awaits him until a new friend intervenes. The image offers unusual sensitivity for an interaction between two boys, one of them an ethnic outsider. Beyond these early illustrations, Sendak channeled his own personal vision into work that was not explicitly Jewish or queer, but exuded feelings and dilemmas of internalized otherness. The same year as his ADL work, Sendak conceived of where the wild things are, initially as where the wild horses are, a vision generated in therapy of a small boy or animal escaping an enclosed space to find freedom, symbolized by a stampede of horses. Before Wild Things came to fruition, this initial idea colored Kenny's Window, the first book that Sendak both wrote and illustrated. At the end of the book, Kenny rides an imaginary lonely horse whom he meets on the roof of his house. Standing on his hind legs, the horse takes Kenny forward to an empowered future symbolized by a boat with Kenny's own name painted on it, a visual prototype for Max's later vessel, which is also labeled with the child's first name. 
The book begins with Kenny's dream about a garden in which he longs to live. And earlier drafts of the book include a male companion named David within this Edenic longing. Toward the end of the book, David does appear in the published version on the sidewalk calling up to Kenny's window in the classic pose of Romeo and Juliet. This image recalls an illustration by Sendak from Mandar de Jong's Wheel on the School two years earlier. Other omissions from the drafts of Kenny's window include Kenny's contemplation of the differences between what he calls his inside and outside selves, as well as his secret difference, which he discovers through a sensual fantasy that features a foaming torrent of milky white water and a rainbow that arches its back. So you might imagine why these parts did not make it into the 1956 published version. Kenny's window and the changes that it underwent in revision reflects the mid-century tension between on the one hand, idealizing a generic child image to symbolize a strong unified national future in the immediate post-war decades. And on the other hand, the desire for children to democratically cultivate and communicate their own individual voices and to express their real feelings, however pained or other. The latter, of course, uh, resonating with anti-fascist sentiments in the wake of the war. Sendak draws Kenny as slender and blonde, like the idealized American children of the time. However, unlike that ideal, Kenny is solitary, save for a romanticized same-sex friendship, and he is emotionally uneven, erupting in moments of vindictiveness, anger, and greed that Sendak felt helped humanize the depiction of childhood. Sendak's early depictions of queer longing reflected not only a covert sexuality, but also a heightened investment in close-knit familial bonds that reflected his Eastern European Jewish background and appeared unusual sometimes in a culture of American individualism. His collaborations with his own brother, Jack, in the 1950s convey otherworldly folk traditions and celebrate positions of effective difference and peculiarities of intuition between siblings. In an early example, The Happy Rain, which was written by Jack and illustrated by then 28-year-old Maurice, children grow up in a fictional village in which it is the norm for the skies to pour out rain that drenches their clothes and muddies the streets. The villagers are traumatized when the rain suddenly ceases and the sun comes out to shine. Raymond and Yolanda, a young brother and sister pair, save the day by considering the clouds' feelings and sending them a note. The last illustration depicts the happy villagers in a joyous horror holding their hands, holding hands in a circle beneath the newly restored rain as their feet kick in the rhythm of a grapevine. In the center of the circle, Raymond and Yolanda smile with eyes closed, heads leaning one against the other. These siblings find solace and comfort in each other amidst a family and community that feels uneasy about sunny optimism and that prefers heavy emotive rain a possible stand-in for the tone of Jewish Brooklyn during the Holocaust and subsequent years, where children like Sendak and his siblings sometimes needed to band closely together to support each other through hardships of post-traumatic family life. And much of Sendak's creativity actually came out of the collaborations, the creative collaborations um, that he offered alongside his brother and sister, uh, plays and stories that they wrote to entertain their world-weary parents. By the early 1960s, Sendak began to disappear to the beach towns of Fire Island for weeks or months at a time to write, to dream, and to decompress from the obligations of a fast-paced public sphere in which he managed his now famous persona. It was on Fire Island that he would write the text for Where the Wild Things Are, basing the wild things on his own Polish refugee relatives, whom he remembered from 1930s Brooklyn as a huge bunch who would roughly snatch you up at any moment frightening, lovable, and certainly beyond the mainstream American childhood representations of the time. Wild Things exemplifies how Sendak's portrayal of childhood had become increasingly free-flowing and fantastical by this time, allowing the emotions, fantasies, and particular associations of the child protagonist and of his own recollected childhood vantage point to lead the narrative and consume the page layout. Others have noted how in Wild Things, Max's developing fantasy is accompanied by the shrinking of each page's white edges as the drawing frame gradually swells, culminating in a wordless immersion in a, a wild rumpus without page margins at all. Drawing on his experience with comics and other media, uh, 
the artist delighted in dra <clears throat> dramatizing this ethos of shifting realities visually and textually and in the interaction of text and image. His characters would continue to use costumes, disguises, and recycled cultural artifacts to convey the transformative potential of creative play. Disguises and carnivalesque scenes in Sendak's work express an ironic knowledge of the unreliability of appearances and of the questionable constructed nature of any given reality, a knowledge that both coalesced with the social revolutions of the time and reflected embodied experiences of immigrants, queer people, children, and other insider outsiders familiar with experiences of balancing between worlds, passing, and seeking meaningful self-expression within systems that operated beyond their cultural reach. As I detail in my book with just a few glimpses on screen here, Sendak's picture books became increasingly bold in the 1960s and beyond. Bold in their celebration of ethnic difference, their condemnation of corporate greed, Puritanism, and social conservatism, and bold in their increasingly direct handling of sexual awakenings, frustrated desires, and memorialization of those lost in the Holocaust and AIDS crises, including his own relatives and close friends. A strange synergy existed for the artist between his perception of those children, those Jewish children whose lives had been forcibly cut short and marginalized during World War II, and emotionally displaced subjects like himself who wished to grow up but found it difficult in a society that ignored, misunderstood, or endangered them. In Sendak's designs for the Nutcracker Ballet in the 1980s, he presented Clara, the protagonist, as a lonely creative child whose dreams of the future are weighted with references to grim realities. The artist reinterpreted the ballet's original text as a story about the pain of growing up misunderstood. Among the darker elements that punctuate Clara's fan fantasies are visual references to Auschwitz. So you see lurking above the ship on which a suddenly matured Clara sets sail in, in her fantasy. Boys sit in structures that resemble guard towers and wear shirts striped vertically in white and faded blue like camp prisoners. Even more explicitly when planning his illustrations for Dear Millie, a bit later, the artist envisioned a Holocaust story that would feature Anne Frank, as well as a scene of children who are marched across a shaky bridge with a guard tower looming behind them. The book depicts Anne Frank together with children of the French town of Isieux, who were murdered at the hands of Klaus Barbie at the end of the uh, World War II. Together, these children form a choir led by Mozart in heaven. Sendak later collaborated with Tony Kushner on staging Grundebar, the 1939 opera by Hans Krasse that was performed by child prisoners in Theresienstadt. The artist also worked with Kushner on a picture book version of, of the opera in 2003. And for visual research, Sendak borrowed an original 1943 watercolor of the stage design used in the camp, borrowed it directly from uh, Justin Cammy, who I thank on screen. The children in his rendition, rendition confer with talking cats and sparrows and grow laterally into the wild animal realm, band, banding tightly together in order to survive their dangerous social reality. They also represent a variety of physiognomies and some of them are marked with yellow stars. In one of the final images of the book, weeping mothers appear beneath giant blackbirds who carry their children away into the night sky. Reflecting the fact that most of those Theresienstadt child prisoners, performers of Rundabar were deported to their deaths, Sendak ends his book with a warning about the perennial nature of hatred. Even seemingly defeated villains tend to return in one way or another, writes Rundabar in a note that's left to the children. Sendak's rejection of the generic child ideal and of its attendant imposed culture of diminutive innocence reflected his convictions about the complexity and seriousness of young hearts and minds who are sensitive to or compelled by the complex realities surrounding them. His child archetypes would lay the foundation for later child protagonists who live beyond the artificiality of generic child innocence, protagonists who navigate the abstracted dramas of history, carrying weighty social and emotional burdens, straddling disparate worlds, sometimes queerly or dangerously so, and always with bravery and imagination, 
from Lois Lowry's The Giver to J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, and other popular television characters like Eleven of Stranger Things, Arya of Game of Thrones, difficult to imagine these figures without the prototypes offered by Maurice Sendak. So now I move into my conclusion. As post-war children's media and the Jewish American establishment sought to shape a unified, optimistic generation across social barriers, Sendak's work spoke to the frustrations and desires of excluded and hybrid subjects, separated from dominant social meanings in a culture that endangered outsiders and that favored white heteronormative social conformity. He identified with children as socially uninitiated creative sufferers who look ambivalently upon the systems of adult society. As an artist, he sought to bridge his multiple worlds by exploring how any child, but especially the frustrated or emotionally neglected child, manages to comprehend and survive the social order. In his work, Peculiar and Sensitive Children, Tightrope Across Limbo Realms, situated between ethnically othered family members and a society that seeks to impose demands of assimilation upon them without always meeting them where they are. In a culture accustomed to dictating reality to children, to immigrants and to other queered marginal subjects, the Sendak child moves from the inside out experiencing and shaping the world through emotion and sensation against uninspired social conventions. Sendak's devotion to the emotional authenticity of the endangered uninitiated child vis-a-vis -vis his memories of his own childhood feelings encouraged forming subjects to honor their inner worlds and intuitions, even against pressures to unify around establishment visions of social progress. More importantly, Sendak offered hope to those who failed to belong or who were barred from belonging hope of finding meaning and self-possession through the queer Jewish virtues of sensitive creativity, critical questioning, incisive humor, and embodied persistence. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for your generous attention. And I think at this point, I'll be uh, turning it over to Naomi Seidman, whose uh, remarks I'm very excited for. Thanks so much, Golan. What a wonderful book, Mazel Tov, on the publication, and what an illuminating presentation. It's so great to have all these images from the book. Um, I think the, I'm going to start by, by just talking about the framework of the queer perspective that is foregrounded in the title of this talk. So these are just a, a, a short list of some of the vistas that are opened up by using that particular framework. Um, the notion of the Jewish immigrant experience as queer, let's say in relation to dominant notions of what a childhood is supposed to look like. Um, the notion of um, the queer child um, in at least three senses that I can think of. So the child who already knows that they're gonna grow up to be queer. Um, the child who's polymorphously perverse, as Freud says all children are, and then the child who's queer because all children are queer in some other sense, some sense of being um, different, not yet socialized, not yet brought into a kind of heteronormative regime. Um, queerness as a, a, a kind of reflection of the reverberations of the Holocaust, in a space in which it's not openly addressed. Um, and maybe for people who narrowly got away, the question of children's literature as a place in which a kind of heteronormative regime holds sway, um, but, it, but childhood literature also, or children's literature also as a marginalized market which by virtue of its marginality is uniquely open to a sort of queer experimentation and also queer artists, queer publishers, queer editors, um, 20th century queer history in which um, Maurice Sendak partakes, um, less in its West Coast, let's say famously West Coast um, geographical location as in the East Coast, um, the Upper West Side, the world of psychoanalysis, Fire Island, um, and what AIDS did to that world. Um, and all of these, you've managed to, all these different 
I don't know, themes or context, all of them turn out to be really surprisingly closely braided with the images and the words of, uh, of Sendak's work and these books that we know so well that it turns out we don't know as well as we thought we did. So thank you for illuminating that. And not only the books, but their larger historical context, their materiality, the networks that go into their production, their marketing, the role of editors, um, the reviews that they got, the kind of open secrets that they embody, all of that somehow comes together around this framework in, in an incredibly rich way. So the first question I have, I have two questions. The first question I have is about that use of the queer framework to bring all these things together. And um, Eve Kozowski Sedgwick um, wrote about two ways of understanding what homosexuality is, right? Before the, you know, before people use the word queer for what I think she was getting at. So she talks about, I think the word that, I didn't look it up again, minoritizing and majoritizing, or maybe minoritizing and universalizing notions of queerness. The first one being um, that there's some, let's say 10% of the population or whatever people think it is now that are, attracted to members, sexually attracted to members of their own sex. And that's who we think of as gay people and everybody else is straight um, or bisexual or, or something on some spectrum. The other one is that queerness is much, much broader a category and includes many, many, many more phenomena. Um, what's interesting is that you do both in this book. That on the one hand, you're talking about a very specific gay man was gay for his entire life, even if somewhat closeted for parts of it, who lived within a very particularly gay world that was very self-conscious about its gayness. Um, and, and on the other hand, there are all these other things that are queer in a different sense, including um, so that even where he lives on Fire Island, he, he hangs out in Cherry Grove sometimes, but he, but he really lives, his house is in Seaview, which is a more, let's say straight Jewish neighborhood. It's interesting you didn't mention that there's a kind of Protestant enclave between those two neighborhoods that is impossible to get to without you know, climbing over fences illegally as I recently found out. Um, so sometimes you even sort of think about the place in between the majoritarian and the minoritarian. So for instance, um, Sendak and his name, which is possibly related to the Yiddish for Sandak, which is the godfather who carries the little baby at the circum, who holds the baby at, at the bris. And his name seems to derive from that. It's kind of an, it kind of belongs to both regimes. It's a kinship a normative term, and yet it's not the father, it's some other person who's in the place of the other, the father. So let's say the gay uncle at the, at the table. Um, so the, it, it, it's some, in some particular cases, the two uses of the term queer are in some tension with each other. For instance, um, as the child of immigrants, Sendak is queer along with his parents, but as the gay child of basically straight parents, um, this queerness also is something that distinguishes him from them. So queerness turns out to be a, dis a, a term of distinction and a term of connection. Um, so my question is, I mean, mostly I just want you to sort of think aloud about this. What does it mean? Does it, what is this kind of, the, the sort of proliferation of the term queer to refer to all these other things that are not about sexual orientation, but that are about immigrant status or, or even the, you know, just childhood. What does that do to the, what are the politics of that kind of translation? Um, and my second question is a little bit related. So should I go move to the second one? And then I think it, I think it might help us think about it. So um, unlike Sarit, I did not grow up hearing um, 
the books of Sendak. I'm not sure why, even though I also grew up in, as a child, well, as a child of Holocaust survivors in a Yiddish speaking home in Brooklyn, actually seven blocks away from the 58th Street address. So that, thank you for that. I didn't know that. Um, so the way that I came to know these books, and I'm not sure I would have encountered them if I didn't actually have a child. Um, so I came to know and love these books by reading them to my son. Um, now, a lot of your argument that there, there's some kind of queer communication going on between the kind of childless queer writers like Sendak and queer editors like Ursula Nordstrom um, that are sort of communicating with children um, almost behind the backs of their parents, as it were. Um, so there's some kind of direct communication that, that the heterosexual parents, let's say, are somehow excluded from, um, that, 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 that somehow there's, there's um, a mirroring of the queer adult and the gay child, or let's say the gay adult and the queer child, by virtue of a queerness that they share. Um, and I would say that, that there's something a little uncomfortable about that because it implies that queerness, which I think some conservative psychoanalysts believe is a, is a form of regression. So I also wanna you, ask you to think about that. But what happens to the parent? Let's say even the straight parent, if anyone could still identify that way in the majoritarian era of, of queerness. But what is, what is this kind of communication doing for all those parents that checked those books out of the New York Public Library or that bought those books and read them to their children and were so relieved to be reading those books and not the Berenstain Bears with the awful sexual politics of those? Um, and clearly, is it just because these quote unquote straight parents are former children and in that sense also queer? Or have you thought about the role of straight parents. And by the way, I saw that, um, I, I hope I didn't steal someone's question in the Q&A. I took a peek at the Q&A. Um, so that, that might be in there too. Um, so anyway, those are, those are my questions. And once again, they're, they're real questions. I don't know the answer to them. I'm not um, trying to stump you. And once again, just mazel tov and congratulations on such a beautiful and rich and important book from which I learned so much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so honored to hear your words and uh, I, I love your questions, which uh, you know, as you say are difficult questions that I'll try my best to, uh, to address. I think, um, I do think a lot about the minoritizing and universalizing uh, dichotomy or paradigm uh, that Sedgwick proposes. And I think you're right that this is something that uh, colors Sendak's experience and that my study is getting at as a whole thinking about the ways in which uh, difference is, is multiple and complex and that difference itself can be flattened and uh, objectified and made into uh, a cultural or political category in ways that don't always reflect the full nuance of an experience of difference. So as you say, there's a sort of universalizing queerness that uh, Sendak's work speaks to, that all children begin in this sort of queer space of early childhood, that all children or most children are bold questioners and creative uh, imaginers and move between fantasy and reality in ways that adults sort of train themselves or for not to do or forget how to do uh, in order to join normative society. Uh, and there's also a universal element in terms of the Jewishness, the queerness as Jewishness as queerness, this notion that um, diasporic Jewish identity, post-Holocaust, post-dramatic, uh, uh, Jewishness as difference in a normative mainstream dominant culture uh, might be theorized and has been theorized uh, by, by, by yourself and others as, as uh, uh, an experience that might be read as queer, right? I'm thinking of queer theory and the, the Jewish question and other works. Um, so there, there's definitely that universalizing aspect. And then in terms of the minoritizing, this, this sense of even within that, that realm of queer potential and possibility and difference and creativity, one might be shut out or one might be misunderstood or buried somehow. Uh, and I think that's something that hasn't really been uh, illuminated or studied intense, intensively enough. And, and I think part of, uh, you know, with just to hypothesize a bit out loud, I think part of the reason might be similar to um, 
you know, why you know, I'm reading a book right now about uh, portrayals of incest or incest cases in the Jewish community, Woody Allen and elsewhere. Um, this notion of Jewish protective politics, this notion of uh, how do we handle difference within an already different community. Uh, so I think I think that uh, Sendak's work, at, at least the way I read it, is um, from from that place of sort of being buried within a community that itself is uh, queered in some way. Uh, he's not part of the the more assimilated Jewish community, uh, which which uh, one might argue does not really fall into the category of Jewishness as queerness. Right. Um, so that those are kind of my my first thoughts. And the other thought I had about that question is that. Uh, the question and thinking about it reminds me of the parallels between queerness and Jewishness in general, in the sense that Jewishness itself is also um, slippery in terms of definition and in terms of how we categorize and organize and understand it. Uh, right, it can be a very minoritizing, distinct identity, a religion, uh, a, a set of genes, a race, ethnicity, uh, which is is very boundary focused, uh, very ritually bound. If if we're talking religiously, or it can be universalized, right, is, is America or New York City, as, as Lenny Bruce uh, jokes, right, Jewish as a whole because of sensibility, because of culture. So I think we have, uh, what I tried to, to do and I, is, is to kind of show how both categories sort of waver. Um, both are these sort of slippery, universal and specific categories that uh, young developing subjects, uh, you know, are sort of left alone to, to navigate uh, in terms of how they identify, where they align, where they're understood, where they're able to say us and, and not feel, uh, you know, to feel part of an us or a we and not feel outside. Um, and I think that's such a big part, or I would, I would, um, I would suggest that that's a part of, of why Sendak is so focused on these dichotomies of inside, outside, uh, fantasy, reality, uh, the, these sort of dimensional shifts in his work, um, at least one reason. And uh, in terms of, ah, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, but a really great question. I love thinking about Sedgwick in, in relation to, to uh, Sendak. I, I don't know if I addressed the second question fully yet, uh, but uh, uh, could you refresh my memory? So the second question, which is also in there in the Q&A, I think, is about um, the, the way you set up a kind of almost secret form of communication between these childless gay writers, editors, et cetera, and the child reader. Um, but Presumably, with very few exceptions, these are books that are being read to children by their parents, and they're being bought by mostly, let's say, straight adults. So how do you recognize the role of these parents um, in this kind of relationship, in this kind of secret co- I mean, are they just clueless, or, or how do you bring them into your readings? Yeah, uh, great question. So, uh, so the my my thinking is going in a few different directions, so I'll try to stay organized. But the um, the first thing I'm thinking, first of all, is that I love this metaphor of the sort of uh, cool or queer or different uncle or aunt, or uh, you know, we need a non-gendered term for that position in a family. But this sort of sidestepping of, of almost parental authority, um, and I think that there's something there. I also think that um, the uh, the reason why queerness is so, I think, successful in Sendex work and reaches children so directly is simply because, uh, you know, as Catherine von Stock and another queer childhood theorist saw, argue that is that children are already sort of queer and that this is nothing that, you know, straight parents, for example, should take personally and that they might, as you, as you suggest, kind of remember their own uh, queerness, their own openness to possibilities, their curiosity about possibilities, their desire to flirt with, um, danger with, to test boundaries, to understand how the world works, to think about what it means to be a human person and to have intense feelings, to exist among family members that are suffering, that are traumatized, that are uh, experiencing various kinds of reality that are not represented in the dominant uh, sort of less inspired mechanisms of culture. Uh, so, so this is, uh, I think, something universal in that respect. That doesn't necessarily have to exclude uh, parents. I, I will also say that, and I think this gets back to the first question a bit, um, so much of Sendak's love for books and for literature came from his relationship with his parents. Uh, I mentioned in the talk the, uh, the ways in which he created kind of makeshift books with his uh, siblings to entertain his parents who were distressed by the Holocaust and the depression. 
also the uh, memories he had of taking out books on Fridays uh, for the Sabbath or on Shabbat to read. Uh, his mother would take him every Friday. Uh, and this, this uh, reading was also something he associated with uh, the kind of physical touch of his father sitting. Uh, he was often sick and indoors. Uh, he had scarlet fever and other illnesses. So this, this sense of being touched and embraced and sitting with his father as he read to him and the book sort of becoming an extension of him. So I think this is, you know, the, the queerness of the texts that they read together, uh, which, you know, sometimes were not texts, were actually just stories improvised about uh, Philip's life in Poland, uh, mixed with biblical and midrashic sort of folklore, um, might themselves be understood as uh, kind of creating a, a you know, to, to really use the word queer broadly, the sort of queer literary bond between parent and child, this willingness to go there, to go into that space of imagination, of sub subversive play, of, uh, and, and this, this argument that I make in the book is also that uh, for Sendak and then for other Yiddish speaking people, uh, you know, in the interwar era, for example, uh, childhood was not seen as, as divided from adulthood in the same way as it was in, in the larger culture, that, that uh, uh, the way that parents treated their children was closer to how one might treat an equal than um, was reflected in dominant representations of condescension, didacticism, uh, right? So this, this sense that Sendak was, uh, I have examples of him being sent home to have his mouth washed out with soap because he's repeating stories told to him by his father uh, during their time together. So there's sort of a mutual uh, queerness in, in being part of a, you know, a different or a minority culture within, within the mainstream. That's, that's a possibility as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating. And I'd like to now ask a few questions that came in from our participants. Um, the first is related very much to your research, which is um, what was the most surprising item or document that you found in the archives and how did it fit into the story in a way that you didn't necessarily expect? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think yeah, there were several, but I think the one that comes first to mind would be the um, correspondence between Sendak and his therapist's partner. Uh, he became close friends with Coleman Dowell, who, uh, the American novelist who was partnered with Sendak's therapist, Bertram Slaff. Uh, and the two of them exchanged letters that uh, were one of the few spaces uh, where I really got to see a different side of Sendak uh, than I saw in his writings and his, correspond his professional correspondences where he sort of unabashedly, um, you know, one might argue flamboyantly sort of uh, letting, part, letting queer parts of himself out. He, he went by a, uh, he went by Natasha and he called uh, Coleman Dowell Max and they had this kind of banter between them where he played this sort of Slavic uh, feminine character to Max's more um, German masculine character. Uh, so this, uh, you know, I, I, it, it plays into the book in the sense that uh, there's a chapter where I look at some of the more, uh, I would say, you know, late 20th century uh, work that Sendak created and his interaction with things like camp, uh, uh, you know, Susan T Sontag's writing on camp uh, and others, and this, this sense of uh, play as a subversive technique to reroute, um, to reroute what might be received as hostility and rerouted toward, uh, toward uh, humor and entertainment and kind of the ability to vent emotion. Um, I have a few questions about Sendak's Jewishness. The first is about his, um, you mentioned his bar mitzvah, and um, someone's curious to know about Sendak's Judaism or Jewish practice later in life um, post-childhood. Um, and then a couple other questions. One about, um, you mentioned Midrash, and I wonder about um, if Sendak reflects at all about some Jewish sources that he drew inspiration from um, or stories that he might have written in his own way, but that were based on either biblical or rabbinic texts. And then a third question about other Jewish artists, for example, Chagall and their impact on the way that Sendak conceived of his own artistic output. Great. Yeah, so I'll say Sendak was an avowed atheist in the sense that he did not, he wished he could believe in God. He, he often wrote, I wish I could believe in God. I wish that I, uh, you know, that there was 
that I had that sort of optimism, but he, he, was, he was still a deeply Jewish and, and specifically a, he imagined himself as a, an unemancipated Jew was the phrase he sometimes used, this, this, uh, this more old world uh, notion of Jewishness that was sort of obviously transferred through his parents' memories. Uh, so I use this notion of trans memory to talk about his work, uh, this, this kind of secondhand memory. Um, he, he worked with Jewish organizations over time. He worked with uh, Jewish museums. He, he curated an exhibit on uh, Hanukkah menorahs, uh, Hanukkiot, um, and uh, later in life. Uh, and and um, you know, in the slide I put up, I show he illustrated a short story collection by Isaac Besheva Singer, the, uh, the Yiddish writer, uh, which included uh, stories that have themes that you might expect in something like a Helm story where, uh, for example, a boy is uh, lifted up on a plank while um, delivering messages uh, and the people carrying him on the plank end up creating footprints in the snow, which defeat the whole purpose of why he's being lifted up on a plank to not uh, create prints on the snow. So these sort of counterintuitive, kind of foolish but wise fool sorts of stories that come from Yiddish archetypes. Um, the, he often referred to his own characters, his, the children he depicted as uh, you know, using Yiddish words. So he would talk about uh, some of the female characters he depicted, the girls he depicted as these, uh, as Yenta figures uh, and uh, some of the boys as uh, uh, Wasserdiker, uh, kind of Schlemiel sort of figures. Um, uh, so, so that's those are a few of the examples that are in terms of the the actual uh, actual scripture. Uh, I don't know, I don't know that he was drawing explicitly in ways that I found from scripture. But but um, I do talk about the use of uh, birds as a kind of favored symbol. He used birds a lot in his work, uh, which uh, you know there's both within queer and uh, Jewish scriptural references uh, the the kind of prominence of birds, birds carrying. Uh, messages and and uh, being carried to freedom uh, on the backs of eagles' wings, right? Uh, he sometimes depicted himself as a sort of eagle or bird of prey figure. Uh, there's there's a there's a book I saw Esau, which was a collection he did where he actually puts his face on a an eagle's body um, in the the kind of uh, front matter. Uh, yeah, those are the those are the examples that are coming to mind. And then the last one I guess I should mention is uh, my gra uh, grandfather's book, which is the the story he created that Philip Sendak, his father, actually dictated to him in Yiddish, um, that uh, actually brought memories from uh, Philip's experience in Poland in his uh, shtetl Zambrova, uh, and and uh, he integrates Yiddish text, as I showed in the example there um, as well. Thank you so much. Um, what, one question actually that um, is a follow-up fr from the audience but follows nicely is if you have um, anything to add about Sendak's depiction of women and girls specifically in his books. Yeah, I guess I'll say that um, he, he believed that the child who he observed and filled his sketchbooks with, Rosie, was her actual name. She was actually a Sicilian child. He thought that Sicilians were just Jews who drank alcohol and laughed more often. Uh, this was in Brooklyn living with in a community of mostly Jews and Sicilians as a child. He filled sketchbooks with this one child, Rosie, who uh, became the protagonist of the sign on Rosie's door and later the star of uh, Really Rosie, the musical, uh, the off-Broadway show that he created uh, and, uh, and CBS uh, musical program on TV. Uh, he he saw her as kind of one of the prototypes for all of the children or for most of the children that he created as a figure who uh, kind of makes something out of nothing, who uh, entertains others, uh, who are less inspired, who are less uh, less driven and less creative. Uh, she kind of threw together pieces of fabric, uh, discarded garments from her parents and created shows involving her friends. Uh, and uh, she she both represented a uh, a, a kind of prototypical creativity that I analyze in the book that in relation to queerness and Jewishness, um, but also a potential warning because he felt that she, uh, she did not know how to leave fantasy behind, that she, he actually encountered this particular young woman when she was older, when he returned to Brooklyn and, and sort of saw her in kind of a bad state. Um, 
And uh, the end of his book kind of hints a little bit at this where Rosie refuses to, um, to go to bed. She's pretending to be the cat and sleeping on the floor while her, her pet cat is sleeping in the bed. She will not switch back into uh, this, this uh, position that's expected of her. Uh, so that's, that's sort of, I think, the, the most central uh, female character in his work that he repeatedly depicts. And he said at one point, all of my children are Rosies. They're all sort of modeled. Uh, but but uh, but but usually more successful at navigating back and forth between fantasy and reality. Uh, the other female uh, figure I would say is his mother, Sadie, uh, who comes up in a lot of his work. Uh, she, in some, he has several depictions in which Sadie is uh, specifically contrasted with images of young uh, boys, uh, which which you might read as a stand-in for himself, who are who are floating in the sky, sort of unmoored. Uh, sometimes dreaming, sometimes in the nude. I actually have Fly By Night right here, actually from 1976, which is uh, his illustration of the uh, poetry of Randall Jarrell. And you see Sadie depicted here with uh, this young boy sort of dreaming at night. Um, so this, he, he liked to kind of pit the, the two worlds against each other or to have them speak to each other. This notion of a private sensual awakening of difference in himself um, and the, uh, the devotion, the the sympathy, the empathy that he felt uh, with his mother. He once said, my entire childhood was feeling sorry for my mother. Wow, this is fascinating. Uh, there, there are a few questions particular to uh, specific books. So I'll, I'll mention them if there's something that you want to add about any of them. The first is Really rosy. The second is The Night Kitchen. Um, and then I, I actually, I'm wondering about Bumble Artie and um, how you explain the decades long gap between um, Sandak's sort of last publication of his own children's book in the, la in the late, in the early 80s and then um, again in, in 2011. So um, specific questions about books. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I guess I'll start. Really Rosie is the, the CBS uh, with Carol King doing the, the singing, the, the music uh, adaptation of The Sign on Rosie's Door, also using integrating the children from the nutshell library uh, from the 1960s, 1962 is that collection. And it's, uh, it, it I think animates Rosie in new ways. You see her as this sort of uh, slightly more matured, flamboyant uh, kind of diva character. Uh, and and the, the children from the Nutshell Library, uh, Pierre and others, uh, are part of this world. Chicken Soup, her younger brother is his name. And you, I, I think Leslie Tannenbaum's article actually is specifically uh, about the Jewishness within that program. Uh, and and I, I, one thing I'll say about it is that it really uh, features some of the darker elements of what it meant to be, or what it was like for Sendak to be a child in a Jewish immigrant neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, so you have, for example, uh, children pretending to uh, there's a scene in which someone chokes on a chicken bone and they think that the, that the person is dead. And uh, so there's some hinting at mortality and, and, uh, and the terrors surrounding that, but also the kind of invention and uh, the, the revealing of, uh, you know, that this is a performance. And uh, so the, there's kind of a theatricality to that work that I think is really uh, exciting. Uh, the, the other works you mentioned, I think, In the Night Kitchen, or one of my very favorites, uh, so that's uh, that's a book that Sendak actually, and one thing I learned uh, was that he, he created that book living in an apartment just steps from, just a couple of blocks from the Stonewall riots. Um, at the time of, the, of uh, you know, June 1969, he was working on that book and living with, his father had just moved in with him into his studio and his apartment uh, because his mother had passed away by that point and he was taking care of his sick father um, so I just love imagining that moment where he's working on in the night kitchen and kind of, you know, this is the symbolic uh, you know, dichotomies that I'm drawing throughout the book of this kind of being pushed push and pull between his sort of old world uh, parental attachments and uh, his connection to this world that's changing around him and evolving around him, these, you know, social revolutions. Uh, he was not himself a gay rights activist. Uh, he was, you know, he was already middle-aged and not particularly interested in politics at the time uh, and believes you know, sexuality was something that he had sort of learned to uh, treat as covert and not something to, to really publicize. He found that dangerous for his career um, 
in children's literature at the time. Uh, but uh, In the Night Kitchen is a fantastic work. It's, it's, uh, it's been censored and banned. It's, it's also a work in which a nude boy uh, is kind of floating in a fantasy world. It, it, it takes elements of where the wild things are in which Max's bedroom becomes a wilderness. And in this case, the, um, you might say that the environment of his actual kitchen and the boy's home and his apartment or uh, some transporting into the city, uh, there, there's a, you know, the kitchen becomes this urban landscape of imagination where these Oliver Hardy-like uh, bakers almost bake him into a cake. Uh, he's placed into an oven and has to uh, kind of erupt from the, the cake and declare uh, his, his uh, distinction from this raw matter that's being baked and shaped. So there's this, again, this notion of resisting the adult forces that are seeking to shape him in a particular way. Um, and he's actually being baked in, a, in an oven that's a Mickey oven. It's labeled Mickey, Walt Disney. So again, this notion of popular culture and children's media being a part of the story. Um, and uh, you know the oven. I, I like to teach this that scene in in uh, you know in my teaching because I think it, it's a it's a really stark example of a moment in which reality really flickers and wavers. On the one hand, you know this is a fantasy scene of a of a child in a in a cake in a Mickey oven with Oliver Hardy's right the the Hollywood um, actor. Uh, and on the other hand, this is someone with a Hitler mustache putting a child into an oven. Right. So this is a uh, a scene that that has both realities kind of built into it, I think, and that I think that's true of a lot of Sendak's work that he 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 didn't seek to simply illustrate text, but to allow uh, text and visual associations to offer multiple meanings and to waver between them in ways that spoke to his own wavering inner realities. Uh, the last part of your question, I think, was about uh, the long uh, period of not creating children's books, and uh, then Bumble Artie. He, he did in the night, or rather he did Outside Over There in 1981, which is a book he described as uh, leading to a breakdown for him. Uh, it, it was a really difficult book for him to create and I deal with it at length in uh, I think my last chapter. Um, and it, uh, you know, it's a book about a child who's kidnapped from their home and being kidnapped was one of his lingering lifelong fears growing up around the scandal of the Lindbergh uh, child kidnapping. Uh, and feeling like a Gentile wealthy child, uh, if they could get kidnapped, he had no chance. Um, his father would actually sleep by his bedside on the floor sometimes around that time to, to sort of comfort him. But he, he, remembered, um, he remembered the kind of childhood fears and, and anxieties that that stirred up. And I think it also relates to the, uh, the way that he felt a sort of false sense of self and the displacement of self that he experienced as he grew up. Um, so the, the child is taken and replaced with a changeling ice baby made out of ice. And he said, the ice baby was me. I was the ice baby that he felt like his mother could have uh, seen the goblin do this or, or do the magic words to, to prevent this from happening, to bring him back. But she was harried and busied and uh, un, unable to do so. And he remained an ice baby that he, he felt sort of taken off the tracks of his own life, so to speak which I think really reflects, um, you know, at, at least this is how I read him in, in, uh, in, in my work, that he's, um, you know, he, he's writing from a place of a kind of displaced adolescence um, that he, and I, I talk about trauma theory in my work as well, um, you know, post-memory is a common concept within studies of Holocaust uh, literature and culture, uh, but this notion of being displaced by a, by a, a memory or a past or a feeling uh, of one's uh, forebears that is so large that it displaces you, um, yet so important that you can't let go of it, that you're haunted by it. Uh, and it, and it, it, it might make you an ice baby, a, a changeling in your own life. Um, so I talk about that in relationship to uh, queer theory, uh, ch you know, children's studies uh, that, that talk about, uh, Catherine von Stockton talks about uh, this notion of growing sideways. So uh, linking that with, linking post memory with this, uh, this queer impulse to move laterally to, to uh, if one is displaced from their own life, to find uh, lateral spaces outward. Uh, if one cannot grow upward, grow outward toward the, the animal realm, the wild realm. Uh, and this is, uh, this is kind of a, an impulse that I think he, he plays with and deals with. But the long, the long story short, I know I'm giving you a long answer, is that uh, it was such a difficult book to make. And he was also so cynical at that point uh, about children's publishing, believing that it had become so crass, so commercialized, frankly, so masculinized. He talks about it in those terms as well, that 
it became this big money-making business by, by the latter 20th century where he says, quote unquote, they dumped the women when uh, as soon as there was uh, a whiff of big bucks, the, the, the sort of macho forces came in and turned this into a commercialized um, business. And he felt that it sort of lost its character, it lost its charm. Um, so he took a break and he pursued a second career in uh, theater design, uh, writing librettos, designing sets and costumes, uh, opera. And uh, that was, you know, Mozart was, was such a love of his. He, he did uh, the magic flute. Uh, which is still performed with his costumes and sets today, and uh, you know, among other other productions. Um, that was an amazing answer. Thank you. Um, you it wasn't too long at all. Um, I I uh, I want to say that um, there are so many questions, which I think is reflective of how exciting your book is and your work, and also the way that you're answering all of this. And we won't be able to get to all of them, but I hope it's okay um, to ask you one final question or or one set of final questions before we wrap up, and that's about um, the reception of Sendak's work. So the first question is about um, you. You talked in your talk about um, you know the the book speaking to the children, sort of bypassing the parents in some way, or um, and the question of whether the successful reception of Sendak's books reflect the values or experiences of children or of their parents who purchased and read the book. Sort of how do we place the parents not as um, those who are beyond the books, but who are the facilitators and um, what role do the parents have in, um, in, in Sendak's success? So that's the first question. And then I'm curious about um, the global reception of Sendak's work. Um, were his books published into other languages? When did that happen? What has been the, um, the reception beyond the American context? Um, and then thirdly, how does Sendak fit in um, not only to the American children's book history, but into a global history of children's books, um, sort of post-war, post-World War II children's literature um, sort of emerging as this force on its own? So I know those are big questions, but those are the final questions that I have um, before we wrap up. Wonderful, yeah, I, I think, uh, so I'll start with the, uh, your first question was about uh, whether, you know, bypassing parents, so to speak, uh, how parents were involved in reception. Uh, so you know, there are many anecdotes that Sendak offered, uh, and some of them I think are in the book, uh, about, uh, you know, children who were too afraid to read Where the Wild Things Are, for example, it would give them nightmares. Um, and there were, you know, Bruno Bettelheim was, you know, famously offered this critique of Wild Things, saying that it was, you know, it's not something you should leave by, uh, leave on a, you should not leave a sensitive child unattended with this work because, uh, you know, there's a, a mother who sends her child to, to bed without supper uh, and, and terrifying monsters, right? So this is, uh, there, there definitely was concern. Um, and and uh, you know, Sendak used to respond by saying, um, uh, you know, just like adults, children are like adults, right? Some, some adults like horror, some don't. Some adults like um, Hallmark, some don't. Some adults like Lifetime movies and some like uh, critical art films, right? So, so um, on the one hand, this is a, uh, you know, on the one hand, I think that there was, uh, you might say mixed, mixed responses, but on the other hand, I think, um, you know, I think that, that parents also were responding to cultural pressures and cultural trends. Um, so after World War II, for example, the generation that becomes parents after World War II, uh, you know, by the 60s, 70s, they are looking for literature that suits their values in the era of the cultural uh, revolutions that are happening, literature that helps uh, their children um, see beyond Dick and Jane, right, see beyond the, the, the values of their parents that, you know, this is part of the Jewish American story and the American story more broadly, this, this kind of generational shift and this desire to, uh, to prioritize uh, imagination, uh, individuality, the ability to, uh, to think critically and problem solve and to, to um, not to generalize, not to, um, to, to paint reality in overly simplistic terms, uh, right? Or to, or to put one's head in the sand and live in, uh, in kind of a diminutive space uh, for, uh, for children. So that's, so I think, I think that there, there definitely was uh, parental support uh, you know, in the 60s, 70s, especially, I would argue. Um, 
And I think, you know, later you start to see more condemnation. Sendak on the one hand becomes a, a much bigger cultural figure by the latter 20th century and beyond, but uh, because of his accomplishments and, and their, their, you know, the waves that they've made in children's literature and culture. But on the other hand, uh, we see some of the harshest condemnations, uh, you know, around the 80s, 90s, where he's starting to take bigger risks and where he is more boldly painting um, sensual and sexual uh, messages, uh, even if these messages are that, uh, you know, people come into their own sensualities and sexualities as opposed to imposing uh, sexual situations on children, for example, uh, which is how some uh, viewed this, uh, viewed examples of nude children uh, for flying through the air. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's important that, that at that moment, there's this, in the lat later 20th century, there's a kind of uh, bifurcation of, you know, Sendak is becoming this huge cultural giant. And on the other hand, he's taking more risks, uh, offering art that's a little bit more uh, pushing the boundaries and being condemned for it. And his work was criticized as overly obscure as, as presenting children who exist in these isolated, uh, obscure realms and never reach resolution, never uh, rejoin society. That was a critique of Outside Over There, for example, that uh, Ida, the, the protagonist, um, never really resolves uh, the situation, never really re-enters a space of normal childhood, so to speak. Um, so, so, so those those opinions definitely existed, and I think that was definitely part of uh, Sendak's disillusionment with uh, with his experience with children's books around the time. Um, I think, you know, maybe I should move on to the other two parts. You, the second part of the question was about um, uh, Bumble Bumble Art. No, we not Bumble Arty. There was something um, else. about global reception of Sendak. Right, okay, global reception. So yeah, so um, Sendak's work was translated into, uh, I don't know how many exactly, but many languages. Uh, he, you know, he, he, he might be understood as part of a wider shift in the US uh, around mid-century where European picture books, and this kind of answers the second, the last question I think as well, European picture books are being looked to as uh, inspiration. So one of his best friends, for example, in, in uh, the early 50s was Tommy Ungerer, who was a French uh, picture book creator who was ultimately kind of banned from the picture book world because it was found out that he was doing uh, erotic drawings, not for children, but elsewhere. Um, uh, and he, he sort of posed a sort of warning to send out for his career that this could happen. But, uh, but figures like Tommy Ungerer and, and, uh, and older precedents, uh, earlier precedents uh, from Europe, uh, you know, spanning all the way back to the, the kind of golden age of children's literature at the end, <clears throat> at the end excuse me, at the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, integrated modernist forms uh, with children's books. Thinking, thinking that uh, children would most respond to, uh, you know, the, uh, the the phrase is, is slipping right, slipping my mind at the moment. But the um, the kind of modernist, multiple self uh, kinds of expression that that you get in uh, in art around the 1910s, 1920s, uh, these these really come alive in children's work. And Chagall, I think you mentioned, is is a great example as one of the illustrators, along with Alice Itzky, of um, Yiddish children's literature at uh, in the mid-century years or in the uh, interwar years rather, um, and you and I think you know looking at the comparisons between Sendak's illustrations of work for the United Synagogue Commission and work by Sidney Taylor and others who were writing to a more assimilating oriented audience, um, there is a kind of scratchiness of line and an edginess and a kind of stylization that I think uh, is more reminiscent of Chagall and Elisitsky's illustrations for Yiddish children's books, which um, uh, you know, were, were Estreich, Gennady Estreich argues, were, were the sort of most exciting and, and uh, vital aspects or the vital uh, realm of Yiddish literary production uh, you know, in the years following the Russian Revolution. Um, so you know, just years preceding Sendak's, uh, his birth. So these might have been representations that were familiar to uh, Philip and Sadie Sendak and perhaps shared with, with Sendak as well. I don't know if I've answered um, all, of, all of that 
This has been awesome. Um, and I really want to thank you and Naomi for a really thought provoking, informative um, conversation and talk. Um, I know that I want to go now and read um, the, the, the books that I have of Sendax and I'm sure other people um, who are listening feel the same way. Um, so thank you so much to both of you. Um, good luck with um, the, the next project that you're working on. Um, and um, I want to just remind everyone who's on um, t right now that we have a, another event um, one week from today at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Jews and Crime in Medieval Europe um, by Ephraim Shoham Steiner um, in conversation with Nick Paul and Magda Tedder. And I just put all of that information into the chat. Um, so thank you so, so much. Um, congratulations on your book. Um, and um, I will see everybody um, next week, I hope. Bye-bye.